will help us think about how Congress can harness technology to strengthen continuity of operations and expand constituent and civic engagement. The pandemic has made clear that in-house technical expertise is incredibly important. Staff are trying to figure out how to make their office technologies work at home, troubleshooting video conferencing platforms, uh, worrying about security, and most of them are not tech experts. And at the same time, members are trying to figure out how to stay in close and consistent touch with their constituents and about how to stay engaged in the lawmaking process. And there's no question that accessing quick and reliable tech help has been a challenge. Increasing Congress's tech capacity isn't gonna solve all of our problems, but it certainly would alleviate some of the strain members and staff have experienced over the past few weeks and months. Going forward, Congress needs to think about developing a modern continuity plan that includes updates to infrastructure and communication technologies. Congress should also consider moving on a bipartisan proposal to create a congressional digital service to help members and staff use technology to better deliver critical services to the American people. And I'm looking forward to the dis uh, discussion today and to hearing what our experts recommend. Before turning it over to Vice Chair Graves, let me just say that this virtual discussion will run much like our last one. After the Vice Chair uh, finishes here, his remarks, I'll introduce our two experts and give them five minutes each to share some thoughts and insight, and then we'll move to questions. Members will have five minutes each. I'll call in members in order of seniority, rotating between Democrats and Republicans until everyone has a chance to speak and ask questions. So with that, I'd like to invite our Vice Chair Tom Graves to share his thoughts. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to our guests and uh, members who are joining us today uh, virtually, and uh, for those like me that uh, are joining uh, audibly today, it's actually pretty cool that uh, we're able to use visual, audible, and digital technology all in, in one capacity here. Uh, it's a great hybrid model for, uh, I'm sure, how things will be in the future. Uh, as, as we discussed, and I, and I mentioned in our last virtual committee meeting, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, it's really incredible that technology like this has allowed all of us to communicate effectively uh, while we're, we're adjusting to this new normal uh, that, that appears to be before us. Uh, we, we've all been scattered across the country now for eight weeks and uh, soon we'll be scattered uh, for a little bit longer. Yet we've been still able to see each other face to face and, or stay connected uh, you know, verbally, audibly in mass and figure out how to keep the ball moving forward on behalf of the American people. Now, I think we all agree this is certainly no replacement for in-person discussions or interactions. Uh, we've, we've discussed that before, um, but it's important that while Congress is faced with these challenges, uh, while our country is faced with these challenges, that we continue to uh, work effectively and be a great example. Uh, last year, we held a hearing. It was uh, on improving constituent engagement through technology. Uh, we, we use new data and technology uh, like these, that what we're using today, video and audible, audio platforms together uh, to improve our lives and connect with each other. And there's no reason that this approach or our approach to governing uh, and representing our constituencies should really be any different. So our goal in this committee is to make Congress work better for the American people. You, you uh, stated that early on, Mr. Chairman, that was uh, our, our core mission and that's why we've passed more than 10 recommendations thus far already addressing technology systems, processes, and policies in the House. And now faced with these new challenges, clearly um, we have room and space to identify more recommendations. Uh, this, this ongoing crisis gives us another opportunity. We get to look inwardly and identify where inefficiencies and outdated, outdated processes lie currently and how we can work together to deliver solutions uh, for those that we represent day in and day out. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, thanks for um, doing this today uh, and pushing through uh, these challenging days. And I'm uh, really delighted to have our our, um, our guests with us that are going to share with us. But with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Vice Chair Graves, and uh, thank you for uh, your leadership and, and partnership as we navigate all of this. Uh, we're joined today by two experts who have a lot of experience in helping Congress deal with tech capacity. Uh, Travis Moore is the founder and director of Tech Congress, an organization that gives talented technologists the opportunity to gain experience in federal policymaking and shape the future of tech policy through a one-year Congressional Innovation Fellowship with a member of Congress or Congressional Committee. As the legislative director for former Rep. Henry Waxman, Travis launched a number of programs to build human capital and improve technological capacity inside and outside of Congress. And Laura Lee Kelly leads the Resilient Democracy Coalition and is based at the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, 
The coalition assesses how data, technology, and new engagement methods can use, uh, can, excuse me, can help build a more resilient democracy, specifically focused on Congress. Ms. Kelly previously led the Smart Congress Initiative with the Open Technology Institute at New America. She was also at the Stanford Center on International Conflict and Negotiation, a civil military expert. She has spent a decade leading security for a new century, a bipartisan study group in the House and Senate. Uh, so with that, Mr. Moore, you are now recognized for five minutes. Excellent. Well, um, Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chair Graves, I want to thank you for having me today to talk to you about improving the, the technical capacity of Congress. Uh, I am the founder and director of Tech Congress, and we're a nonprofit startup um, whose mission is to serve as a pipeline for technical expertise into Capitol Hill. So we place computer scientists, engineers, and other technologists as technology policy advisors to members of Congress and congressional committees. I launched Tech Congress in 2015, and prior to that time, I had served as legislative director to Representative Henry Waxman. And I started Tech Congress because I needed Tech Congress when I was a staffer. In 2011 and 2012, the House was considering a cybersecurity bill, and it was a tough vote uh, for Congressman Waxman. I was trying to understand how companies secure and anonymize personally identifiable information so that I could make an informed vote recommendation. And what I found was there wasn't a staffer in the building that could explain those concepts to me. Uh, as a consequence, I had to go outside of the building for advice to an interest group, which was deeply unsettling. Um, and this is important because tech isn't just a slice of the policy making pie. It, it touches every issue in every committee's jurisdiction. So we launched Tech Congress, and to date, we've sent 29 fellows to Congress, with five more starting in a month. I'm proud to say that we've uh, prioritized diversity, equity, and inclusion since day one. And as a result, 43% of our fellows are people of color, and 39% are veterans. Uh, these are rates that are order, orders of magnitude higher than the tech sector at large. Fellows have served uh, in the House Oversight Majority and Minority Staff, the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Representative Del Bene uh, on the panel today, uh, Senator Warner, Senator Cotton, and many others. And on issues like government surveillance, encryption, autonomous vehicles, and facial recognition. In our current class of fellows, we have a former startup founder working for Senator Portman who helped execute on the Senate Homeland Security uh, remote hearing um, uh, last week. We also have a former cybersecurity researcher from Cisco who's working for Senator Sherrod Brown and has been supporting the Senate Banking Committee's two virtual hearings. In fact, Jenny and I and the team have been texting ahead of this um, because her, her expertise is so relevant. Um, so you know, although these fellows came to Congress to work on technology policy issues, their technical IT and digital expertise has been hugely helpful in this moment. Their experience has led to Congress to launch a more formal effort to explore whether we should bring in fellows to support the institution and the hardworking institutional staff we know are working tirelessly to support Congress to adjust to this remote context on digital capacity needs. So things like remote committee operations, digital signatures, or making permanent the ability to submit bills or statements for the record electronically. And so first I wanna commend the Modernization Committee, um, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chair Graves, for the recommendations passed out of the House on March 10th. These are a roadmap for exactly what we're discussing today. And also the leadership of Chairwoman Lofgren and, and Ranking Member Davis and the staff of House Administration for their leadership getting this committee off the ground in the first place. These are massive steps forward. Now, I know uh, we as Article One don't like to look to other branches of government uh, for, for advice, but I think the executive branch model for digital transformation is important to look at. Um, and I think there are two sets of lessons learned from what they built that we can look at. Uh, first is the structure of what they built, and second is the process for what they built. So on the structural side, they built three verticals for digital transformation. First vertical is 18F that does really important but less flashy work of the executive branch, like migrating the executive branch to the cloud. The U.S. Digital Service, uh, second vertical, they work on big priorities, things like healthcare.gov, things like helping identify security vulnerabilities at the Pentagon. Uh, and then you have the third vertical, the Presidential Innovation Fellowship, to build creative prototypes for new tools and services. In Congress, one could imagine similar parallel structures where you supplement the hardworking institutional staff of the CAO or clerk with additional talent like 18F has done in the executive branch. 
there could be another layer that works on top level priorities that are public facing. One stop top shop for tracking tools for flag requests or case, case work, for example. And then you could have fellowship programs like ours that exist to prototype creative solutions that could save member and staff time and taxpayer dollars. Finally, on, on process, the US Digital Service didn't organically come into being. There was a crisis when healthcare.gov crashed and the executive branch picked up a plan, one had, that had already been written for digital transformation. Our crisis right now in Congress is operating effectively during a pandemic and the Modernization Committee, Committee has already written much of the digital transformation plan for Congress. Now is the time for Congress to prioritize this work and implement your work, your roadmap. I look forward to questions um, and exploring how Tech Congress can be supportive in that effort. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, with that, uh, let me invite uh, Ms. Kelly. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, members of the Modernization Committee. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Lorelai Kelly, and I work on congressional modernization at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown. I'm really looking forward to this discussion about how remote technology and mobile connectivity can enable us to carry on with the vital operations of the whole first branch during COVID-19. And more, I'm interested in how Congress's experience during this emergency will build on the very significant modernization portfolio generated by this committee over the past 15 months. I've doubled down on what Travis just said. Our point of departure for building today's emergency system and ideally our future legislative continuity plan exists because this committee has already thought about the needs of the whole institution. So I've been working on congressional capacity for some 18 years, part of that or decade as a staffer, and I've really never been able to say this until now in the middle of a, pandem of a pandemic. Um, we know the technology exists for building secure distance systems. The more apt question is how do you want to operate existing technology? How do we create the diverse configurations and niche capabilities for this complex and multitasking workflow? How do we um, incentivize innovation and build confidence and socialize these new tools among staff and members? Uh, to be sure, this pandemic is creating a huge moment for shared perspective, not just here on the Hill, but for millions of Americans who have moved their work and collegial relationships to online video platforms and other hybrid mechanisms. Like, like them, some of what we need in Congress are these simple workflow changes like, like the House subscribing to the bulk purchase program at Apple. That's going to open the door to all sorts of customized tools. And I want to give a shout out thank you to Mr. Davis for your letter. These kinds of incremental steps can become very significant tipping points as we're seeing. Um, I attended nearly every hearing of this committee since the very first one. It was a member day in March 2019. And over the course of these last year and a half, this committee has already identified many of the areas that need exploration on tech capacity. The challenges that have repeatedly come up in hearings are the gaps that we see today. You could call them maybe the existing tech capacity conditions of Congress. The good news is that the collaborative specializations that you configured, rules and procedure, budget and appropriations, tech, civility, and schedule, these are all excellent categories for looking at what Congress should be doing right now to build industry standard systems technology. The architecture already exists for every one of these categories, either in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, in the executive branch, or in other legislatures. Um, and to be sure, today's challenge is to keep Congress operational. It's not a technical one. I want to make sure to recognize that this is an abrupt cultural transition and one that includes a lot of loss. Um, In-person experiences like eye contact or a smile and a wave in the cafeteria, these are the human experiences that we all cherish. And I think the best outcome can be if we can channel these feelings into a unifying effort and rally behind this institution so it has even more momentum to modernize on the other side of the pandemic. Um, I'd like to just quickly share with you some of my research that might be useful for both continuity of Congress and for uh, taking into account important information from your constituents during this pandemic. Over the past two years, I've spent much time doing field research in congressional districts. I've been looking at ways to leverage, uh, leverage the nationwide network of district offices, some 900 of them, 
that could provide timely and shared input for policymaking. Um, my research revealed the need to harden and improve the connectivity between the capital city and the district. It also pointed out the need for a modern knowledge sharing commons, a, a shared data archive with input from communities across the USA. This kind of information resource would not only be helpful for policy deliberations, it would be a vital hub in a crisis. So this challenge is in stark relief right now. How do we make sure offices can learn from each other quickly? Members must be the first movers in this space um, because we, we need this to be owned by Congress and the first branch. I've also been looking at other properties in the first branch, like the Federal Depository Library. Could they be geographically dispersed nodes of some kind of a first net for Congress, a secure communication system for emergencies? I mean, at the very least, every member should have some kind of securely configured cell phone in a safe somewhere in the district. Um, last fall, my colleagues and I wrote a memo to this committee. It was about the need for remote capacity for the continuity of Congress in an emergency. And we wrote that memo because you had asked for ideas to identify next steps in modernization. It was really serendipity because the committee made this request right while we were looking at how to pilot a method for remote witnesses to testify at field hearings. Um, we ended up piloting a model called a side hearing, which stands for stakeholders, individuals, data, and evidence. We wanted the method to be both agile and structured. It was kind of a compromise between a field hearing and an open mic town hall. Uh, we piloted this first side hearing in New Hampshire last August, and the event provided an opportunity for constituents to give testimony that informed a bill under consideration. And then it was in, entered into the committee repository during a markup. I believe this model would work very well for COVID themed events in districts right now. Um, as you know, shared public deliberation is a critical function of Congress. It has to investigate in order to legislate. But this function also gives Congress the ability to raise all kinds of issues for the public consciousness. Side hearings could be a way to create an informed and empathetic perspective of shared national purpose in this pandemic. Just think what remote technology could do to create awareness. These member-led events could be like a participatory site visit. We would all be able to hear from people we would otherwise not be able to hear from. Say last year, what if the firefighters in California had GoPro cameras on their helmets so viewers could see the massive damage from the fires, not just the individual houses? And today, we can't actually see how crowded ERs are. We can't see the people on gurneys in the overcrowded hallways. What if members had a pop-up hearing kiosk set up outside hospital COVID wards where medical personnel could deliver immediate information post-shift? The ability of Congress to elevate the voices of Americans in their own words on this, which is on the ground today, they could help tell the story of what we're going through. And, and the silver lining of this pandemic would be a proof of concept for Congress to renew and revitalize the whole deliberative process. Um, I'm going to stop here and hopefully we'll just get to the rest of this in the Q&A and I'll make sure to, to uh, give this memo that I wrote with my testimony to the staff so that you can refer to the things that I'm mentioning as possible. Um, use cases or beta tests yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for your testimony. Um, we'll uh, roll into questions here and I'll start with myself and then um, I'll go to Vice Chair Graves and then we'll just uh, take members based on seniority uh, going between Democrats and Republicans. My first question is for Mr. Moore. You know, obviously Congress is trying to figure out how to function in the middle of a pandemic that's thrown up a lot of hurdles. Um, many of them have been tech related, including as we've seen this morning. Can you talk about how some of the continuity and capacity building projects that tech fellows uh, could could tackle? What what kinds of processes or upgrades might they put in place that would help us better manage uh, remote work? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chairman Kilmer, for that question. So I think there are a number of, of things and they fall into two buckets. Um, the first bucket is uh, is is are the recommendations that you um, you all have passed out of the house uh, a few months ago? Um, digital signatures is a no brainer. Um, uh, I think um, on the um, video conferencing side, um, what would be helpful is for every staffer uh, to have a have a license um, for video conferencing and teleconferencing, conferencing, so they're not fighting over those licenses for constituent meetings. I think fellows could help by building secure features and custom add-ons. Um, to some of those tools. I know, for example, on the WebEx we're using, I'm obviously dialed in, but um, there's, not a, there's not a timer 
uh, there's not a timer function. That's something that a fellow could work on. In terms of bills, making permanent the electronic bill um, introduction portal that the clerk has worked on, allowing for extensions of remarks, um, co-sponsorships with a button click, um, improving appropriations request portal um, to simplify that process. And I think um, lastly, you know, I think a general playbook for committees and for offices on uh, how we adjust to this remote environment. Um, you know, we've heard of uh, inconsistent adoption of certain tools and technologies that are available. Um, uh, the Committee on House Administration produces a model employee handbook that it makes available to staff um, and offices. Um, we should have a model remote or telework uh, handbook, which uh, details the technologies available. Um, so those and, and, a, and, a, and a variety of other things that I think that they would find when they get in into the institution and start asking questions and doing user research. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, we've already been thinking about some of the things that have been discussed in this committee previously, you know, so in a, you know, in a world where uh, members may not have a, you know, uh, may not want to spend a whole lot of time uh, in close quarters during a bill markup, you know, using the technology that the Natural Resources Committee already uses for electronic voting might be something that would enable markups to happen uh, more expeditiously. You know, the House Armed Services Committee uses uh, iPads rather than um, handing out or, or tablets rather than handing out uh, paper copies, right? There, there's some things that just seem like no brainers. Um, uh, even setting aside remote work, just having um, even in-person work function better. Um, Ms. Kelly, you, you made a remote appearance before the, the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee a couple weeks ago to talk about technology and continuity of government. I'd like to hear more about how remote connect, uh, technologies can help us to expand our outreach and, and to better connect with constituents on the ground, like first responders and small business owners who can share some of the firsthand experiences uh, and information with us. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think that um, uh, there's all kinds of ways using technology that people are familiar with to collect um, information and then place it on the record. When we developed the side hearing up in New Hampshire, we did it within the rules of Congress. That, and, and so, as you know, like field hearings have a, a lot of permissions and, and quorum requirements. What we were hoping to do is create something more agile where the member basically acts as the curator of the of the people in the room um, and the staff and they all have the sort of a, the division of labor is is uh, you know a content moderator um, rules of engagement upon coming to this event and then uh, providing a a template for statements for the record for everybody who's in attendance because congress is becoming machine readable that sort of community data archive, I think is going to become increasingly important to inform legislation. Um, and that it's also tagged by the district. So in the template that we made, and by the way, this case study will be up on the Georgetown website next week with all the details and the one pagers and the playbooks for your staff and yourselves, um, is that it needs to be tagged by the district. So we just tag everything as New Hampshire one, New Hampshire two, and, and easy searchable, discoverable terms. So that again, uh, what's happening right now with uh, COVID, it could just be sort of COVID-19, a date and the district and where this information was shared. And that then the member comes back in the official process and enters a, either an extension of remarks or in the committee repository, which is a really, um, a, a wonderful possible way to sort of bring back some of the functions of the subcommittees, which was the subject matter expert layer of Congress. So we were looking at that and to make sure that we share it broadly. Um, so the side hearing is one possibility. Another couple ones was a, an asynchronous question and answer platform that my tech partner, Marty Harris, developed on Popbox and already piloted with Katie Porter. So that is one that's uh, ready to go. It was um, part of a graduate students uh, PhD uh, dissertation, it went very well. And it was really substantive uh, commenting. And it, again, it was moderated and curated. And so we're at this stage where we need to figure out ways to manage the information input. And mo members and staff are just the best local curators because they sort of, they know uh, who's been working on this and who's, who lives in the area where 
in the New Hampshire case, it was PFAS, which is groundwater poisoning. Right. And you had this broad cross-section appear, and it all went on the record. And so um, that and the other one is the Natural Resources Committee. Is, it, they, they did a collaborative editing platform that was basically uh, originally formative written by the pollution impacted communities across the country. So it's really leveraging the, where the trust already exists. Lots of opportunities for that. And the, but you know, at that the member uh, needs to either lead or that a, a civil society organization or maybe a, another venue in the district could set up. But um, the idea is to capture this data and capture this information so that it can be shared and used by everyone. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, to both of you. Great, great testimony. Um, just <clears throat> sort of a couple quick questions. I know the, the other members have questions. You know, our, our previous recommendations came under a different time, as a different era. I mean, it's hard to imagine what it was like a year ago. Um, everybody was uh, looking ahead and, and looking for positive solutions and forward thinking. And it seems like, though, of late now, since we've hit the pandemic and and a lot of other things and, and being forced into modernizing or using new technology or doing things different, different it's taken a partisan shift uh, of adaptation. Any suggestions um, from either one, and you know, maybe Travis first, and then Lori Lee uh, next. Any, any thoughts on that? On how? And I know this committee has, has done a magnificent job of being bipartisan, but you know, even with some of the votes that are taking place currently, they, you know, everything's just turning partisan, even though there is a need for the adaptation of new technologies and new ways to connect. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, you know, I know it's sort of a political question too, but. Yeah, uh, Vice Chair Graves, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, my, my instinct here is um, we need to get um, people to work on the issues that are, um, that need a couple tests. That they're uh, they're apolitical uh, and nonpartisan. One, uh, two is that they're going to save staffers time, uh, save members time, and then three is that they'll save the institution money. And and I think a, a huge number of the recommendations that you've made um, uh, um, uh, out out of committee and, and on the floor, um, I, I think there is widespread agreement on. Um, and my you know. My, you know, the, tech, the, the tech way of thinking, I live in San Francisco where Tech Congress is a startup, is start talking to users, build, build the smallest thing you can, iterate on it, take feedback. And, and I think that on the tech projects, you know, um, flag requests, wouldn't it be neat if, uh, I know, I, I, this may not be urgent, but it would be a way to get a, a, a big win if we could have a, you know, UPS style delivery tracking tool so that a constituent can see where their flag is. Um, you know, I think making uh, making it easier for staff and members to introduce bills and building on what the clerk has already done. I mean, I, I think with a variety of these projects, um, the, you know, the most of these projects are not political and, and, and I, it would be a shame um, for them to become that because uh, um, I, I think I just think that they, they're, they are win wins um, across the board. Thank you. Lori Lee, any thoughts? Hi, yeah, thank you for that question. That's so important. Um, I actually think right now is a, a chance to, to frame um, issues as institutional, national, patriotic challenges. Uh, the Article One uh, series that you started um, was, was just an example of that. This beautiful story that we have to tell as a nation that gets so drowned out um, because often it's this sort of 24 second news cycle, um, a lot of comp competition from the executive branch and, and other news sources. But really, my sense is always that there's, there is a constituency out there for sort of explaining and sharing information, especially if it's generated and sort of curated locally. Um, it's almost like the perfect job for Congress, which is this big platform in between the people and the federal government. Um, the other thing about, about technology is that it requires a certain intentionality that I think might be really, really good for civility. And I'm not an expert on this, uh, but I know that there are behavioral scientists and others that have been looking at data and digital and technology and human interface for years and that they can help us build things like rules of engagement for this uh, distant technology and these dis distant uh, participatory events. Um, 
I think that the the other thing is just to push on through, just like Travis was saying, just start doing these things. Uh, they are basically constituent serving models of how we move forward and, you know, be intentional about sharing. I'll just tell you a quick story about my life on the Hill. I ran this study group in the House and Senate, and at one point it was sponsored by two members who would have been in a food fight in a bar if they had ever been in a room together. Um, it was a liberal Northern California Democrat and, and a senator from Kansas. And that study group was so successful because we always just stuck to solving the problem, getting voices from on the ground. Um, these were deployed uh, JAGs or, or civil military officers working with diplomats in all of these out of area missions over the last 25 years. And so we're sort of in an out of area mission right now. And, and my experience with that is it was completely 50-50. This program um, was so beloved by the House and Senate that Senator Luger actually embedded it back into his committee staff and just created this permanent um, uh, shared knowledge system in the Senate that was shared with the House. Um, Congress also has lots of models of this in its muscle memory, like the caucus system. The Arms Control and Foreign Policy Caucus was the House-Senate bipartisan so I really feel like there's sort of a group of of uh, early adopters or tech nerds or ledge branch article one groupies, <laughs> of which I am one, <laughs> Travis is one, that would love to help you just push on through and like just you know, eyes on the prize and don't let the partisan stuff. This stuff is, un is unimpeachably sharing. It's about article one. It's about... Um, it's about moving forward as a nation. I really feel like there's an audience for that out there right now. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Great, well, thank you, thank you. And um, I, I know Chairman and all the committee appreciates both of your thoughtfulness and, and encouraging words today um, and, and as we're going through this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Um, and uh, let me recognize someone who's worked uh, hard on these issues, um, our Chair of House Admin, uh, Chairwoman Lofgren. I recognize you for five minutes. Let's see, do we have Chairwoman Lofgren? Oh, I'm looking. We may have lost Chairwoman Lofgren. Uh, so while we work to get her back, uh, Mr. Woodall. That's a wonderful show of bipartisanship, uh, Mr. Chairman. We can't get a, a Democratic committee chairperson, so we're going to go to rank and file Republicans uh, to hear what they have to say. <laughs> I, I, I value that. Um, I, thank you all both uh, for being here. I want to uh, uh, go back to what you were talking with Mr. Graves about. Uh, I serve on the Rules Committee. Uh, we just went through the process uh, yesterday in nine hours of of, uh, of of pushing all of the committees uh, to a place where they can do uh, virtual hearings uh, tomorrow. I, uh, Laura, I heard you talk about the uh, the Senate and the way folks had real buy-in. Uh, not everybody, uh, but a group of of, uh, of of tech nerds, as you call them, folks who were committed to the to the process. Travis talked about uh, getting an idea, proving it uh, uh, in a model, and then scaling it up. Um, we are so laser focused on responding to an enormous crisis uh, that we really feel compelled to do everything and do it all right uh, right now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the 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 benefits or the dangers of uh, of of doing it all right now, as opposed to to finding the the committed small group, finding the the scalable project, and and working it up. And if we find ourselves in that trap of of moving too quickly and 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 having the model not work the way we hoped that it would, uh, are there some some uh, uh, tried and proven pathways back uh, where folks have tried to do too much too quickly, uh, but rather than letting that uh, wreck the exercise, uh, there's, some, there's, there's some easy emergency uh, escape routes. That, that is a great question. I, it, yeah, <laughs> sure, I would, I, I would be, I'd be delighted to take a, take a first stab at that. Um, Representative Woodall, thank you for the for the question. I think I think what's really important here is um, I, I really believe in um, pill, uh, picking a couple projects 
um, that everybody can agree on um, uh, that you can get some small early wins that can build momentum for more work. And I do think that there, you know, when we think about, you know, congressional uh, digital service fellows or, or supporting the clerk and the CAO, you know, we think about you know, a lot of the recommendations that you've, you've already passed out of the house. Um, and that, I, you know, I, as a former staffer know where pain points six years ago, like, like digital signatures, um, like being able to introduce a bill electronically instead of having to walk a piece of paper into the Capitol building and drop it in, in the hopper. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, my, my belief, and this is the, the Silicon Valley belief, is, is start small um, with, with, a few, um, with a few things you can get big wins on, and then you build on that momentum. And I think the U.S. Digital Service is a great model here. I mean, hey, they did make some mistakes at the outset. Um, and then, um, and then it has carried on. And I know that uh, Jared Kushner and, and Michael Kratzios um, in this administration are, hu are, are huge, huge supporters. USDS gets a 17x return on it on its investment. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I take your point. I think your point is 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 fair. That let's find some let's find some meaningful small projects we can get some big wins on, and then and then and then play for the long term there. Marla? Yeah, the, um, yeah, I would just say, like, um, I think that there is sort of an invisible uh, uh, audience out there for American civics. Like, we as a nation are sort of in, uh, digging our way out of a civic memory hole right now. Um, people love, you know, uh, people love to talk about uh, the institutions of democracy. I mean, just look at the success of Hamilton the Musical. That's my favorite example. Um, we need to help Americans like fall in love with their institutions again. And I really think that they have the bandwidth, especially now, for this little bit of a longer explanation of the process of Congress. Like, why is this complex system so frustrating? It's frustrating because it is such a complex system. It has representation in its DNA. Like, the, the idea that you could run Congress like some kind of a top-down parliamentary system has, has never been true. Um, one of the places I always stopped on my district research visits was uh, of maker spaces in libraries and in universities and some of them downtown in uh, they're like big shops like when I was in high school these were like the shops where they had the, the common tool shed where everybody made things together um, and it seems to me like right now there's a way to reframe the states from sort of laboratories of democracy to like the maker spaces of modern civics um, Travis is living in the sort of minimal, you know, minimum viable product world of where you just throw it on the wall and iterate and iterate. It's never like this sort of the best Congress is going to do is a sort of accelerated, in, in, accelerated incrementalism <laughs> is what I called it. But I really feel like um, you just got to go out and when you're doing it, say this is a proof of concept. Um, you know, when you log into the House Clerk's Office, it still says beta on it. Um, we're in a beta mode for democracy right now. Uh, you know, our system is set up to be the garage tinkerer's paradise of self-governance. <laughs> um, I think that's the way to explain it to people. If you try something and then you just say, like, r right up front, like, this, you know, this didn't go in the direction we intended. We're going to go back and, and, and tweak it and work on it some more and talk to some more people who've done it and we're going to try it again. Or um, that's, I just think that there's an immense, uh, an immensely sympathetic audience for and a huge appetite for that out there uh, in the in the public. Um, I hope that you've seen that in other ways. But people love that that sort of modern schoolhouse rock. We need it desperately, and Congress could be the star of it right now. <laughs> Say, don't make me break out into my schoolhouse rock uh, renditions. I still have them all uh, committed to uh, committed to memory. And when they sell tickets uh, uh, to the Derek Kilmer, uh, uh, Tom Graves uh, musical about the Select Committee on Modernization, I will buy one of those uh, 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 tickets. I, I got to tell you, uh, uh, it, it is it is uncharacteristic uh, the kind of leadership they brought to to, to moving both. Both teams uh, in in uh, uh, not in lockstep with one another, uh, but in close step with one another towards that uh, that goal and and that natural tendency to be suspicious uh, when the other team runs too far ahead uh, has uh, I think thwarted some uh, some projects. Um, uh, but I'm I'm grateful to you all for helping uh, to press us uh, to press us forward and 
and uh, and Chairman, I'm grateful to you for bringing uh, the experts to us today. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Um, and uh, we will wait till our next hearing to hear uh, uh, Rob Woodall's performance of I'm Just a Bill. Um, so next up, we've got Mrs. Brooks, Susan Brooks. If hello, we... sorry. Yeah, we have you. Great. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. And thanks so much um, for continuing our discussion. I think it's really, really important, uh, especially right now. And thanks to our witnesses who are passionate, clearly. And it's fun to, uh, you know, I kind of wish we were at a maker space throwing all this up on the wall and talking about all of this um, in person, but obviously that's too difficult right now. When I came to Congress, I could not believe I had been a U.S. attorney and I couldn't believe that we didn't have the capability uh, like the Justice Department did when I got here to have video conferences, like back with the district office. We really didn't have the capability to do that well. And we also didn't have a secure phone line. And um, I had a secure phone line as a U.S. attorney in 2001 that could have gotten a call from the president or from the attorney general or what have you. Um, and we used you know, that system. I don't recall what it's called. Um, and I've always been very surprised that we don't seem to have that capability. Um, and yet, and even during this pandemic, when I've gotten on a couple, and maybe I've already mentioned this in the last hearing, when I've gotten on a couple of meetings, um, it's been like a party line. And I actually got put into by the service, and I don't recall if it was Zoom or WebEx or just a conference line, might have been a conference, who knows, but I actually did get physically put into another, some other completely unrelated meeting that when I listened just for a very short period of time, I saw that I was in another meeting and I just hung up. I didn't say anything, but that caused me some concern about the security um, of how this would work, um, particularly as we, you know, do go to more remote offerings. So knowing these limitations and the challenges we have, what would be a realistic timeline to create a secure network among our district offices that would allow for this continuity of full operation? What kind of timeline are we talking about? Yeah. So uh, that's my first question. Lorelai, do you do you have thoughts on that? Well, do you want me to? One of the things is like, I, I could just say like I I uh, had I have a group of, of friends and who worked on enterprise architecture, secure systems. One actually worked both for Amazon and setting up the CIA's secure cloud for things like remote work in the intelligence community. And I, I have a feeling that if we put our minds to it and we said, this is about uh, the first branch of government, this is about building a resilient, we cannot have a single point of failure in three branches of government. We need to do this now and like make it a, a national challenge. Um, just like, you know, the last time we were under sort of, sort of a, a, a fragile system threat the defense industry came together and they put aside their short-term profit motive and they said, we are going to build the best system so that the United States is going to carry on and continue to be a leader and a model. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, I think that we could do this in, in a year, a year and a half, if we had the buy-in, the support from the private sector and, and, and uh, all members of Congress uh, speaking in, in a unified voice. Um, that's my sense, and I can ask technical experts, and they could give you a much more precise. Uh, but I feel like that the the examples exist out there, and a lot of it is just making sure that they're um, applied in the congressional framework. Travis, what do you think? I'm, I would just add in that timeline question is probably above my expertise, but I will say two things. 
One is we had a we have a fellow who's now full time in the Senate that got uh, the Senate phone lines encrypted, so um, they weren't before uh, his his pressure. Um, uh, and and I should say, you know, we put up a, a, a an application form to say, hey, would you be interested in working in, in Congress and working on improving digital services? And we had 267 applicants in 12 days. Uh, and 67 of them had worked on government tech teams and 20 of them had worked on high security level government tech teams that have done this in the executive branch. So the talent exists, we just need to get them into the institution and working. That, that's awesome to hear. Um, and I do think maybe that's what it was is that we had an encrypted line, but that was at the Justice Department and that was in 2001 for goodness sake. So I've always been kind of surprised that we're just, we haven't been there. My next question is uh, about FirstNet. And um, FirstNet is that, you know, critical uh, system that's being built out for first responders um, across the country. And most states have, I think all states now have probably opted into it. And it gives first re responders priority when the, uh, when the, systems are inundated and they have a secure, I believe that's what it is, secure lines in order to communicate um, within a state, but also across states. Is that something that we should model our, uh, our system after is the first net system? My sense is that it's a, it's a good model, except, you know, it is for the executive branch and um, that there are a lot of people working in the executive branch, and I know a couple of them who would be more than happy to share sort of best practices that would be transferable to Congress. I, I think it's important that Congress leverages its own real estate. I mean, truly, like, Congress and the first branch have the best real estate in democracy when you think about a devolved system or a decentralized system. And um, that's what this needs to be. And that uh, I think it, it just deserves its own, you know, workshopping um, or legal clinic, which is to sit down and look at uh, what is in the first branch and what could be like a, a federal depository library. It could go from being an analog stack of books to a, a community digital archive that also has this emergency capacity. Um, that is maybe has both a communications function that's secure and a convening, somehow a convening function locally that is secure, um, that is also something that's possibly shared by all the local people, the first responders, the mayor's office. As you know, a lot of local uh, localities in, in local government are really ahead of the curve and setting the tone, like uh, chief data officers and digital strategists and innovation officers at the state level. Even if you look at like um, the state, the conference of state legislatures, their website has a whole continuity of government link, which is really interesting to look at how states are approaching this. But I think just like the hearings that you've had, I mean, this this emergency system exists out there, uh, and that we could adapt it for Congress. And I would also add that the heavy lifting has been done since 9/11 on the need for dedicated. Uh, spectrum and a communication system dedicated for uh, governance in a crisis. Like to me, uh, that is, is is not nearly such an obstacle anymore. Um, and we can talk about it in in that context and make the case really urgent. And I'll ask my colleagues, and then I'll yield back. Do we still have a, a guest line, a government emergency something line? And if so, I certainly lost my card or information as to how to use it. Does anyone know? I think um, maybe our next uh, question would be the ranking member of House Admin might be. Uh, I hope. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Mr. Davis. Well, hold tight. I can check my wallet to see if I has, still have that card. <laughs> emergency contacts. Uh, exactly. Hang on. We Government Emergency Technology Telecommunication Service. Yeah. Still here. Here's my code. That's line. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have my card anymore, Rodney. I need one. Thank you. <laughs> I will write that down. Um, you know what? After this is over, while I'm done, after I'm done with the questions, I'll try calling it to see if it still works, and then report back to you guys. 
Hey, uh, Chair <laughs> Kilmer, Vice Chair Graves, thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, this is a great time to uh, this is a great time to to really. Oh, I see we got a five minute clock. I like that. This is a great time to <clears throat> debate this issue and talk about these issues because of what's going on on the floor today. Uh, I am somewhat disappointed, as is Vice Chair Graves, that a lot of the work that this committee has done to really talk about the need to modernize Congress, bring in more technology, uh, has been, in my opinion, too, somewhat hijacked by partisanship because there seems to be a rush. There seems to be a flow to move so fast now into what we were debating as a committee uh, in, a, in a much more functional and, and uh, uh, typical manner. Uh, that's the question I ask is, are we now moving too quickly than what we even would have imagined a few short months ago in our committee? I think we're all open to remote technology, but I can tell you there's probably not two people that are witnesses to a hearing in Congress that are more technologically advanced than Mr. Moore and Ms. Kelly, and we can't see them. So we still have problems with the technology, even for those who are pretty used to using it. That's why, you know, we've offered a crawl, walk, run approach. That's something I endorse. And I certainly hope as we move forward with remote technology, I clearly have been after three hours in the rules committee yesterday, I'm clearly against uh, voting via this technology at this point in time. But having hearings like this, it should be easier to use. That's why I think we need consistency. I think we need uh, I think we need to be able to continue to test technology uh, like this that is going to allow us to, to function as well. I certainly would have liked to have seen Mr. Moore and Ms. Kelly, but I'm glad you're on the line. Uh, you know, we had a lot of examples, too, of projects here in the House that uh, unfortunately have taken too long to implement. So remember the Atlas project, if you were a staffer like I was years ago. I, I don't know if that was ever completed, but... Those are the types of issues that I think we have to find that balance. Now, let me ask you, um, I'll, I'll first start with, uh, Mr. with Mr. Moore. We talk on this committee about the CAO and their office of HIR being ready and capable to be able to handle a move to remote technology. I'm not convinced they are yet. Are you? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for that question, Ranking Member um, uh, uh, Davis. I I, uh, I I don't know that I've I've studied the CAO and HIR to to know uh, just how just how ready they are or not. I will say I, I know that they are trying trying very hard over there in the CAO's office in particular, um, and I think that this is where um, some extra help um, could be could be useful. Um, and uh, and and extra help that in particular understands um, both the private sector tools um, that are available and the unique security needs of government. Um, and I think that this is where, again, as Article One, we're, we're, we sort of don't like to, to look to other branches of government, but I think it really would be helpful. And I I can say personally, we've just had an outpouring of interest of people that that are raising your hands and, and want to help and. Um, and Congress needs to figure, figure out a way to, to bring them in in this urgent time, um, like the executive branch has done when they've when they've had urgent um, kind of crises on their their um, on their tech side. Okay, Ms. Kelly, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi. Yeah. Thank, uh, yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I I think that there's a group of people that are friends of Congress and have really have got the sort of trust and social capital to um, ask those kinds of hard questions. Um, and get honest feedback. I'm thinking of Congressional Management Foundation, that's over at Georgetown, uh, Travis's group, like people who've really worked on the public interest uh, institutional behalf of Congress that could uh, talk to people and get a, a better sense of are we going too fast? Um, can we keep our uh, heads down and push on through and not be distracted by outside noise? Um, I also think it's important to, in this question to look back at your own hearings over the last 15 months and the discussion about the weaponization of transparency. That's a very real concern that I believe it was Francis Lee and Mark Strand, um, Josh Tauber, folks that have really uh, looked at this and, and um, can talk about like what, what is the, that sweet spot in between the prerogatives of the institution and the demands for accelerated 
more and more participation. I mean, Congress is an indirect institution. It's a democratic republic. It has never been a direct democracy. And I think that, that the people um, need to hear that, but also need at the very same time to hear how it's working to open up and to uh, become more inclusive. And, it, and it's a bespoke system, just like a tailored suit. Like you can't just, you can't just um, give it anything to wear. I mean, it has to be carefully considered. And one of the ideas that I threw around uh, last year with the clerk's office was could we take that really wonderful map of legislative status steps? I don't know if you've seen it. It's legislative status steps at the Library of Congress. And it's a decision tree of the House and the Senate. Um, and really at every node, at every decision node, figure out like how fast you can go. What is the compromise? Where, uh, what kind of technology is okay there? Um, and I feel like that that's just a real deserving conversation that everybody's having. It's not just Congress. Congress as an institution needs to figure out um, <clears throat> the limits of transparency uh, in order to do business. And it, it's an honest, a forthright explanation of how the system works and its process and its DNA since it was founded. So, like, I, I feel, I feel how, um, just, uh, I guess, I feel really intimidated by this as well, because we're also in love with the traditions and we know that that a lot of what exists in Congress now protects it as the first branch of government. But I do also think that there are people who you can draw on, and just in the ones I mentioned, or the, the folks that are working in the continuity of Congress cohort, that could really help come up with ways to negotiate that um, almost at every step. Like, what, like, let's get a sense of what how people are feeling here. Is this going to work or is it not? Is it really? Sorry, sorry thank you. Good. Well, I lost my timer, so I know I'm out of time, I'm sure, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, however, uh, I do want to say to, to Ms. Kelly, thank you for bringing up the district offices. As somebody who spent 16 years there, they do not get enough attention and they have to be part of this debate. Um, and I do want to just flag, you keep mentioning the FDLP depository libraries as a possibility for secure telecommunications. Keep in mind, just recently, the FDLP uh, computer systems were hacked twice by nefarious uh, actors. So uh, we got to make sure that we secure those facilities first. But Thanks again for your time, and we appreciate the opportunity to hear from both of you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I, I believe we have Chairwoman Lofgren back on the line. Uh, I'd be happy to yield to her for five minutes if she is indeed on the line. I may be wrong. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Timmons. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I hear you. Great. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for putting this together. I know we've had some issues getting everybody on, but um, we're these are growing pains, and we're going to get through it. So, to the to that point, I want to begin by just kind of I just did a little chronology of the last nine weeks. Um, we started out with this house telecom, telecom number we had a conference call in, and I think the volume at the beginning made it unreliable. We, my team had issues getting on. We had all these calls scheduled, and it was just kind of a, a the beginning of things to come. And so we then got Ring Central. Ring Central has been better, but um, you know it's been somewhat challenging. Um, we 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 have Zoom, and we've been using that, but obviously there's issues with it. Um, I've been on financial services calls with the Republican members, and we've had issues. Where's the operator? We've we've had dial-in issues. The Republican-wide conference calls have been challenging. Um, the financial services bipartisan calls have been embarrassing. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 laughable to the point that it's really not even funny. It, it's just been. Uh, an overwhelming challenge that uh, uh, Congress has had. And then, you know, video calls, I was just checking my computer. I've got seven different apps for all these different platforms. And it seems there's this, this, this competition right now for what the future holds for both Congress and for um, the, the business world. And, uh, you know, 
on top of all that is then political calls, which have to be on a separate platform. My question to um, our, our two experts is, what is our plan? What, what is our plan to fix this? What, how are we going to have a Congress-wide option that is actually working and everyone knows how to use it? I might I might weigh in on that quickly with a with a couple points. I think that's a I think that's a great question, uh, Representative Timmons. And and I would say a couple things. Um, first is uh, I I, I want to take credit. A couple of the the hearings that have have gone off really well in the Senate um, were 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 managed by our fellows. So um, so John Yaros is a former startup founder who's working for Senator Portman. Um, and Jenny Cam, who is a ten-year researcher at Cisco, um, who knows so knows, knows WebEx very well, <laughs> working with the Senate Banking Committee, and so I, I think that's a you know again they came in to do tech policy, but their skills are really relevant and useful, and so that's been very helpful. Um, second, I think I think what might be really helpful at this stage is again looking to we have a model. Um, the Committee on House Administration has their model employee handbook. We should have a model uh, handbook for uh, operations and telework. This is the kind of thing that if, if we're able to source some congressional congressional digital service fellows, I think they could they could put together and think about best practices um, and think about the tools that offices should be um, should be adopting. And the last thing that I would say is that um, you know in in a crisis, uh, you know the healthcare.gov crisis, the team that came in to fix that was five or six people. Um, so with a really strong small tech team, you can do a lot. Uh, now, U.S. Digital Service is now 150 people, um, and and that's still small. You know, I think they said that they'll get a 3.5 billion dollar return on their investment over the next five years, and they they 17x their their ROI on investment. But so I think I think more bodies in in the institution that could produce a playbook and looking to these executive branch models could be helpful. Uh, thank you for that. I guess I do have one follow-up. I've been on all these different, but well, let me, before I get to that question, uh, my office was fortunate enough. My predecessor, Irishman Gowdy, was uh, willing to purchase. We got 22 MacBook Pros um, on his way out that were waiting for us when we got here. Um, and, you know, we've been very blessed to have those. Everybody has the, the latest uh, iPhone whatever it is, 12 or 11, uh, and we have all the different MacBook uh, or iPad Pros. We have this incredible, you know, wealth of technology, and it seems that a lot of these offices don't. So, I mean, I think a natural response, and I want to, you know, commend House Admin for opening up the 2019 MRA leftovers to allow members to make sure that they have all the telework technology they need. That was very helpful. Um, do you think maybe there's a role for this a best practices mandatory? I hate that I'm even going to say this mandatory training for members to do things like this is what the mute button does and this is how you use it and um, it, you know training people on how to get on these uh, video calls. Do you think that would be a good idea? I certainly think that could help, and that and and that is that is something that especially people that. Um, have user experience and design knowledge. I mean, this is a key part of what Silicon Valley does so well. Is that you know the the, the three-legged stool of a tech team includes a designer and a user experience person. So they sit down with they sit down with a member, they sit down with a, with a staffer, and they see how they use the technology and they design work workflows for that. And you can build trainings off of that. So I, I absolutely think that would be a helpful offering. I think I'm running out of time. Last question. So as far as video conferencing, uh, I mean. There's all these different options. What are the top one, two, three in your in your opinion? Uh, well, so, well, I guess I'll, I'll take. You know, we I use Zoom. I've been using Zoom for four years. I know there are some um, there are some security concerns about Zoom, um, but I, I don't. I think those are I think those are manageable. Um, what I hear from our fellows is that those are manageable, and in fact, we, I know we've had fellows that have worked that have looked at investigating those security practices. Um, I know you know Cisco is the is the tool that's available for the WebEx is, is available for you now. Um, I think there I would just say there are a lot of potentially off the shelf solutions from the private sector that that may be useful and available for Congress. I think what's important is having someone in the building to have those real honest conversations about the security um, uh, implications and then also the risk that if, if 
these things aren't approved, staff and members, if a tool is in order of magnitude better um, uh, and it's not approved, staff and members are going to be tempted to use it. Um, so, um, so, you know, I think having someone that understands the security, a unique security uh, trade-offs in those, in those conversations would be, would be uh, helpful. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think I'm over my time. Um, I, I've had a great experience with Zoom, and I just want to get everybody on the same page so we can uh, communicate effectively. So with that, I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Timmons. Um, let me invite, uh, first of all, um, given our technology challenges, I want to make sure if we have any other members on the line who wish to speak, um, uh, please let me know. I, I think we have run through all the members, at least that I have uh, been informed are on the line. I am not getting texted or having anyone chime in. Um, uh, would anyone have a, a second round of, of questions? Otherwise we will close, but I wanna offer that to, uh, to any member who wishes uh, any follow-up questions. Okay. Well, um, then I think we have covered it. I'd like to thank Mr. Moore and Ms. Kelly uh, for sharing their wisdom with us today. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone for their willingness to keep the committee's work moving forward. I think that is indeed important. Um, Vice Chair Graves, uh, any closing remarks on your end? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I think this was a great, great hearing. And uh, it was good to see it done in this, this fashion. I know it was a hybrid, but I think effective. and. Um, that's all for me, yielding back. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, thank you to the staff of the Select Committee for their work in setting this up, uh, not just in securing us two terrific expert speakers, but in helping us work through some of these technology challenges. We will continue to work through them going forward. And with that, this discussion stands adjourned. Thanks everybody, take care. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.